Welcome, everybody. I'm Jennifer Widom. I'm the dean of the School of Engineering. Uh, we have in the audience today graduate and undergraduate alumni, and we have members of the community. I also wanted to mention that we are live streaming to thousands of alumni and friends all over the world. Uh, the School of Engineering has been co-hosting a series that we call Intersections. It brings together faculty from the School of Engineering and from Humanities and Sciences to share insights on a common theme or idea. And this tonight is the third in that series. Uh, we have the series because we recognize that world's most challenging and complex problems need to be addressed not by individuals working by themselves, but by people working together and talking together across disciplines. We also value an understanding of the relationship, the very important relationship between humanities and technology, and I would say especially today and, and urgently into the future. And the themes in the book being discussed this evening are an incredibly dramatic example of why having that understanding is so critical. I'm really pleased that uh, Persis Drell will be the guest tonight. Uh, Persis is a colleague, uh, she's a friend. She's the provost at Stanford and the former dean of Stanford Engineering. She's a scientist and she's someone who's thought very deeply about what we like to call the humanist engineer. Yeah, don't you see the danger, uh, John, inherent? Uh, in what you're doing here. Genetic power is the most awesome force the planet's ever seen, but you wield it like a, a kid that's found his dad's gun. Dr. Bauman, I learned a great deal from you at the university. had done, and you, and you took the next step. You didn't earn the knowledge for yourselves, so you don't take any responsibility. Our scientists have done things which nobody's ever done before. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think they should. Please welcome your philosophy talk host to the stage, Professors Ken Taylor and Joshua Landy. Technologies like artificial intelligence and bioengineering be the salvation of humankind? Or will they destroy our bodies, our democratic institutions, and even our planet? And who is going to control the technologies of the future? This is Philosophy Talk, the program that questions everything. Accept your intelligence. I'm Josh Landy. And I'm Ken Taylor. We're coming to you from Simex Auditorium on the Stanford campus. Continuing conversations that begin at Philosopher's Corner, where Ken teaches philosophy and I direct the Philosophy and Literature Initiative. Welcome everyone to Philosophy Talk. <laughs> Thank you. 
and let's hear it for our musical guests, the Tiffany Austin Trio. Today, we're thinking about monstrous technologies as part of Stanford University's Frankenstein at 200 project. Monstrous technologies? That's a strong word, Ken. Well, Josh, come on, look. I love my iPhone, but got to admit, smartphones are causing an epidemic of distraction, insomnia, and depression. That, that seems pretty monstrous to me. And that's just techno panic, Ken. Techno who? Look, 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 people are always freaking out about the latest technological invention, you know, like the printing press, the mechanized loom, newspapers, electricity. It always turns out there was never anything to worry about. Oh, Josh, come on. Tell that to the inhabitants of Chernobyl or Fukushima, or, or, or the victims of asbestos poisoning, or, or, or all those thalidomide babies. Uh, you, you're a big literary guy. It's just like Mary uh, Shelley says in her novel Frankenstein that we're thinking about. Technology can be deadly. Very silly. What? You, you, look, you've watched too many Frankenstein movies, Ken. The, the, novel, the novel is a lot more subtle and sophisticated than you or Hollywood are making it out to be. I mean, look, that novel, it's not just some Luddite screed against the, you know, the horrors of technology. I mean, look, it's, it's a philosophical investigation into personal identity. It's a, it's a brilliant experiment with literary form. It's an exploration of deeply buried antisocial impulses. I mean, that no, novel... Yeah, no, you're forgetting the main thing, Josh. It's about, also about a technological marvel that runs around killing people. You left that out. <laughs> all right, all right, fair point. Touche. <laughs> but, but, remember that great scene in the novel where the creature learns about language. He calls language a godlike science. And, and writing, writing, he says, opens up a field for wonder and delight. Oh, Josh, you're waxing so poetic. Oh, big deal. Well, like, not just a big deal. Writing is a technology. And it's among the greatest technologies ever invented. The novel celebrates that kind of technology, and, and we should, too. Oh, look, Josh, look, look, look. I, I love writing, too. I mean, that, that's why I spend hours and hours writing myself. It's not just because I have writer's block. It's because <laughs> I love writing. I even love other people's writing. I love reading your writing, Josh. <laughs> But you know, even a technology as glorious and as powerful as writing has its downside. Look, no writing, no Mein Kampf, no Mein Kampf, no World War II, QED. Technology can be busted. Uh, Godwin's law, Ken? Uh -huh. Look, 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 it's not the technology of writing that was responsible for Mein Kampf. You know, it's the guy who wrote it, and it's the people who read and, and believed it. I mean, you, you can't blame technology for what people do with the technology. You have to blame the people. But you're missing my point, Josh. Technology is often designed, explicitly designed, to, to, to exploit human weaknesses. Why, why do you use your iPhone so much? Why? Because it's a drug, Josh. <laughs> and so is social media. And social media is this addictive drug is driving people to suicide, and it's ruining our democracy. Sounds like you don't trust people very much to handle their own technology. Oh, why, why should I? Well, OK, but what, what do you want? You want the government to intervene? I mean, that's paternalism. Look, look if I want to waste my time watching cat videos on, on Facebook, that's my business. No, no, Josh, it's not just, it's not just your business. My life is, is impacted by your choices. Their lives are impacted by your choices. Facebook and its addicted adult users, they're destroying our democracy, my democracy. OK, I'm, I'm not going to defend Facebook. Well, that's good. <laughs> but, but, but the question still remains. Right? How can we prevent all the negative outcomes, the monstrous outcomes, without losing all the benefits? And how can we have the good outcomes without resorting to paternalism and, and stifling individual freedom? Well, that's a good question, Josh. I, good question, but I, I think the answer is kind of obvious. Technology producers and designers have to take on some of the responsibility. They have to do a better job of predicting, compensating for the effects of their inventions. And, 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 and they have to care. They have to care about more than just creating cool, fun gadgets and, you know, making a bunch of money, Josh. Yeah, and pigs have to fly. <laughs> well, look, if producers refuse to regulate themselves, well, then the rest of us will just have to make them an offer they can't refuse. What? 
don't, don't take me wrong. I'm, I'm talking about changing the incentive structure. Oh, okay. So taxes, regulations. Or that social kind of stuff. shaming, maybe. Yeah. Well, look, I agree we've got to do something. If we don't do anything, nightmare scenarios may well be around the corner. I agree with you. That we're going to start seeing things like on Black Mirror. Right, right. That's a great TV show. But, but you know how much of that show is pure fiction, and how much of it is future reality? Well, as it happens, Ken, we asked our roving philosophical reporter, Liza Veal, to find out. She files this report. So if you've seen the show Black Mirror, you've wondered, how crazy is this stuff? Total fantasy? 15 years away? 10 years away? The interpersonal rating system in this episode seems familiar. It's the oldest foresight institution in the country. They don't predict the future, but they anticipate it. I didn't know this kind of thing existed, but I'm glad it does. We can only achieve the future outcomes that we can envision. And so if we can imagine more possibilities, then we, can, we have more choice in where we go. Hendrix says Black Mirror is, and bear with this tongue twist, it's worth picking apart. He says the show has gotten people thinking about the implications of the technology we're beginning to use. Though it's set in the future, it's grounded in very real existing possibilities and liabilities. So how far are we from the futures depicted in Black Mirror? That's what Dylan Hendricks is going to talk about. In some cases, not far at all. This episode is pretty straightforward. It's basically 40 minutes of this robot chasing this woman. Hendricks says this robot is based on an existing one developed by a company called Boston Dynamics. They're quadrupeds with machine learning capabilities, similar to artificial intelligence. They actually learn by being in the world, by sort of actual feedback and experience of the world. So they're learning how to open doors, how to recognize objects, how to navigate terrain. Hendricks says it won't be long before this technology is used by the military, but it also won't be expensive to manufacture for personal, private consumers. That is something that we are going to have to deal with in our lifetimes, very likely, um, of this idea of sort of guard robots that are just, that are so capable that they're, they're terrifying. So that's an example of something that's not at all far-fetched. We have the technology to surveil and control our children more than we ever did. So we face a question. Are children allowed to make mistakes? Isn't that a part of growing up? And if you stop them from making mistakes, will they make bigger mistakes later? The way the mother sees through her daughter's eyes, Hendrix says that's the most far-fetched aspect. But it's not crazy. I mean, it's, it's not impossible, actually. I will say that there have been studies done of reconstituting um, sort of memory images from people's brains um, under uh, CT scans. So the idea that we could eventually sort of capture images directly off of the optical nerve and translate them and broadcast them, that, that's not insane to think that we could do that at some point. In the episode, Be Right Back, a woman, Yudrick says, without a theoretical understanding of what consciousness is, there's no way to theorize a path for creating it. We're stuck. If we get any closer, it will be the kind of discovery on the level of discovering fire, something that changes everything. But what we do have is machine learning. Computers can cull enormous quantities of data and learn from them, so they can perform in ways that we don't program them to, but that they've taught themselves to. The effect can appear to us as consciousness, but there's kind of a big difference there. It's a recurring paranoia in Black Mirror that machines or entities will be able to hold consciousness, ours or their own. It comes up in the episode USS Callister. It's about a virtual reality world that players can control and design. But, and this is a minor spoiler, the people in the simulations are actually sentient. And because this guy's a jerk and he's abusing them, the abuse is real. The technologies become more mainstream and accessible, which is, is sort of inevitable because they're, they're already, we've already reached a turning point where they're very compelling. Um, that people will want to spend more time in simulated environments. Hendrix is an optimist. The main bone that he has to pick with Black Mirror is how terrifyingly dystopian it is. As a futurist... There's a strong desire for us to have sort of more identification of, of what are the uh, positive futures, right? What are the things where we use technology to actually solve problems in a, in a real way? So when it comes to virtual reality, Hendrix doesn't just see doomsday scenarios. He sees opportunities. Here's one. He says, if we can't stop humans from doing bad things to each other in real life, then maybe we can channel that antisocial behavior into virtual reality. 
Here's an example that might be a little hard to swallow. That, that sexual assault in the real world went down because of these kind of simulations existing. Is that simulation not then kind of a public good? Right? Like if, we, if it turns out we can't fully deter behavior, but we could channel it into something uh, where it's less destructive to real people's lives. Hendricks says this question will only become more pressing. And it doesn't just apply to VR. Does this, ne does this technology have more potential to encourage impulses towards antisocial behavior or to mitigate the consequences of it? Hendricks is asking these questions. So are parents, so are some technologists. But who has the final say? For Philosophy Talk, I'm Liza Veal. Thanks, Liza, for that tour of the dystopian possibilities for the future. I'm Ken Taylor, along with my Stanford colleague, Josh Landy. And we're coming to you from CMEX Auditorium on the Stanford campus as part of the university's Frankenstein at 200 project. Our guest today is a, form, is a physicist and former dean of the School of Engineering here at Stanford, who recently became the 13th university provost. Please welcome to the Philosophy Talk stage, Persis Drell. Thank you. Welcome, Thank you. So, uh, Persis, Josh and I were talking earlier about potentially dangerous, even monstrous technologies. I, I know that's been a topic that you've been interested in for a while. W when did you first get interested in these kind of questions? Well, I, I think the right answer to that is I grew up with it. Um, my father was a theoretical physicist who um, spent part of his life pursuing the dream of understanding the natural world and then spent a lot of his life pursuing the, uh, the attempting to preserve the world from the horrors of nuclear war uh, as an arms controller. And so it was in the house from when I grew up. Good, so, good. Where, so where did that leave you? I mean, Ken and I were arguing earlier about whether we should be optimists or pessimists. I mean, you know, the threat of nuclear war, something is on the horizon. So do you, do you think that there is now, or there is, you know, coming up some, some Victor Frankenstein type who's about to unleash something really deadly on the world? Or do you think basically we're, we're gonna be okay? Oh, I think there are all these engineering students out there who are working on things that could in, unleash something terrible on the world, but it could also be something that's wonderful for the world. That's the way technology and discovery works. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Well, I'm just optimistic that the good will win. So, okay. Well, so, wait, wait, wait. wait. <laughs> so you're, you're optimist. I mean, I want to take the world at large, because mm. we're, we, we're focused, we can be focused on the American context, you know? If Hitler had won that war, if Stalin oh. had not, yeah. you know, if Stalin had, well, he did prevail for a long time. He sure did. He visited horror upon horror. Yeah. yeah technology in the wrong hands. Some, some terrorist gets a dirty bomb. I mean, in total, looking at the world in total, what controls technology in the world taken in total? People. In the end, it has to be people taking responsibility for the technology that they create. The technology is going to be invented no matter what. You can't stop it. Can we keep uh, germ warfare, germ, germ weapons, nuclear arms, uh, 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 chemical? Well, we, Chemical weapons are all over the world. There's the cheap, there the, there's the, there's the cheap dictators, weapons of mass destruction. Can we t keep problematic technology out of the hands of all problematic people? We can never do it perfectly, but we've had nuclear weapons since 1945, and they haven't been used since 1945. It's a great example. We have biological weapons that we so far have controlled. Does that mean we can stop working at it? Absolutely no. But so, it, you can be, you have reason to be optimistic. So you look out at the world, you look out at global warming, all this sort of stuff. You look out at the world and you like are confident and optimistic. <laughs> and you don't look at it like those folks on Black Mirror. Oh, so right? I've never watched Black Mirror. So I don't want to speak about Black Mirror. So your world is more a Star Trek world than, <laughs> no. than a Black Mirror world. We're going out there, solving all the problems. But if I wasn't optimistic, where does that leave me? Well, maybe vigilant. I mean, right? So I maybe, is there believe a... in being vigilant. Right. So, okay, so, so what about you know, things that are on the horizon, things like, for example, you know, video fabrication technology? I mean, it seems like 
if I understand correctly, we may be on the verge of people being able to make you be saying on video anything they want you to. And yeah. I mean, so who's going to control that kind of thing? Well, that's a really good question. <laughs> well, then, you well know thank what? you. We'll get to that. We'll, okay. So we'll try to answer that really good question and more really good questions from our audience after this short break. This is Philosophy Talk. Coming to you from Simex Auditorium on the Stanford campus, our guest is the provost of Stanford University, Persis Drell. In our next segment, we're going to talk about how we can balance exciting innovation against social responsibility. How do we get the upside without the downside? Invention, attention, and prevention, along with questions from our technologically savvy audience when Philosophy Talk continues. It's close to midnight and something evil's lurking in the dark <laughs> Under the moonlight you see sight that almost stops your heart You try to scream Whatever takes the sound before you make it yeah. You start free Looks you right between the eyes You're paralyzed Cause this is real love Thrill the night You're fighting for your lives Inside an evil seeming night And this real love Thrill the night You're fighting for your life Inside a killer Thriller tonight Night creatures to walk in the masquerade There's no escape in the jaws of the alien this time This is the end of your life Yeah Cause this is real love Real night There ain't no second chance against the thing with forty eyes cause Thanks again to our musical guests, the Tiffany Austin Trio. This is Philosophy Talk. I'm Josh Landy. And I'm Ken Taylor. Our guest is Stanford physicist and provost, Persis Drell. And we're thinking about monstrous technology. So we're soon going to be taking questions from you folks. So if you have a question, please uh, take a spot in front of one of these microphones at the front of the stage. So Persis, OK. I mean, we live in a capitalist society. I think capitalism makes it really hard to balance innovation against social responsibility. Can we do it? Well, I would say we have existence proofs where we've done it in the past. I would say we've done it with the nuclear technologies, and we've done it with some of the biological technologies, like recombinant DNA, where the community has really stepped up and taken some responsibility and not just pushed technology as far as it could into commercial applications, because they recognized there were potential dangers and threats out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you really are an optimistic person. <laughs> and I'm glad you're our provost. I'm glad, I wouldn't want a downer for a provost. I really wouldn't. Right, I just wouldn't. But I, I got to say, I'm much more of a downer. I just, I'm not sure I believe in the capacity of capitalist production of technology to always regulate technology for the human good. And here's why. Because the decisions are made kind of locally. That is, yeah. I'm going to automate and make my company more efficient. I'm going to lay off workers. I don't think about the aggregate effect of that. I think about my competitive advantage. This person competing with me. And it's not just within this economy. It's around the world if I don't do this. So the pressures are all generated bottom up locally. But then they aggregate into something a mess, right? And I so, think we, we saw this in space with, with, with Facebook, but, right? I mean, and Twitter. I mean, the, 
the way in which these social media, you know, their, their profit uh, is driven by clicks and likes yeah. and shares. And those are driven mostly by controversial news stories. And so, so conspiracy theories and yeah. fake news, well, they're good for the bottom line. Yeah. So I, I think what you're bringing up is a really good point, which is that with the two examples I gave, the threat was evident early. Right. You right. knew there was a really serious threat out there. I think the threats, and they are very real, um, and we've seen them acting out from, from social media, uh, machine learning, those, we didn't realize they were dangerous. Right. And so now we're in a somewhat different situation. I, I would also say another stark difference in, in my view is that in the cases, again, let me use uh, nuclear weapons or, or, or uh, recombinant DNA, the, there were leaders of the field who stepped up and led. Where are the leaders? Well, right, but that's, that's quite, I mean, I think the threat from nuclear weapons is, it, you're right, it's dark because, you know, people used to think about uh, limited nuclear war and all that sort of stuff, and then all these studies came out about nuclear winter, and it's like, oh my God, mm -hmm. we can't just trust this to the Soviet Union and the Americans fighting it out. It's like, the whole world is like, has a right. stake in it. Right, and I think global warming's the same way, mm -hmm. but there's a like who goes first problem mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. And you know, the Paris Accords were, were cool, but you know, look what our current mm -hmm. president did, mm -hmm. right? I mean, but still there's a who goes first problem, right? Mm -hmm. I, could, I could free ride off the world mm -hmm. doing this. Mm -hmm. So I, I just think we don't really have mechanisms that kind of force the balancing of innovation and responsibility. I, I just think we have precious few mechanisms. Well, in, in the case of, of, of global warming, I think capitalism will come to our aid when the economy starts to tank because of the effects. Um, but I'd still go back to the internet and say the challenge there is, I think the, there is the recognition of the problem is now r real but I'm not yet quite seeing where the leadership is right. going to come from. If, we, if the field itself does not take some leadership, I think that's when regulation comes in in a very heavy-handed I mean, way. I mean, I offer that can't refuse, like I said in the opening. Yeah, I could, I could agree with you now, Ken, on this one. Yeah. Because, okay. you know, when you, when you see what's, what's actually coming out of Facebook now, it seems as though either they're genuinely in denial or they're in some kind of, you know... Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Though, see, again, it's a, but there is a logic of capitalism, and we are capitalist production, and markets are cool things. I don't want to deny that markets are cool things. And I think Facebook's business model depends on something important that they're a platform, not a publisher, right? Mm. And I think they're, they're being a platform allows them to say, let, let all comers come, and, and we like that. We're like, oh, there's freedom, there's accessibility. If we force them to be a publisher, well, I don't know, and then take on all the liabilities and obligations that a publisher has, that I actually don't know if they survive economically, right? right? So I, I think this is non-simple. How was that decision made? How was that decision made that uh, they were- be a platform and not a publisher. How did because they're good capitalists, right? Because what's happening to the publishers? They're right. getting hammered by this new technology, right? right? right. And if they take on the certifying and verifying and distributing and being liable and all that stuff, I don't, I don't think they get all those, uh, those, those investors to invest in them. I, I don't know. There might be some of them in the audience. Would, would, would they have gotten all those investors to invest in them if they said, oh, our business model is we're going to be a publisher? Yeah. Maybe, but meanwhile, if we're relying on people within those industries to do self-regulation, it seems to me we're just putting the foxes in charge of the hen house. I'm well, not sure you, we're really going to get very far. You're giving them competing incentives. Right, exactly. So right. the incentive structure seems to be wrong. I mean, I, and I don't know whether process, I mean, you know, I love it that you're an optimist, even about global warming. I, I mean, I think you're a little more of an optimist than I am. You know, maybe capitalism mm -hmm. will kick in after mm -hmm. everything, yeah. it's too late. But anyway. Um, <laughs> But so what, you know, what do you think? I mean, t is there a way that we could, uh, maybe without regulation, maybe we could so change the incentive structure at least at the level of the social and make it uncool to destroy the planet for cash? You know, stuff like that. <laughs> so are we talking about global warming or are we talking about the internet? Sorry, Just so uh, I know which problem no, I'm pick, talking pick, about either here. One. Pick the one pick you one. want to talk about. Yeah. Pick the one you can be optimistic about. <laughs> what optimistic about. Um, well, they're really very, very different. Yes. Um, I think... I think on, on, the, on, the, on the issue of the internet, I think the, 
the threat has become visible in recent years. And I actually see evidence that the, um, that the thought leaders are starting to think about how to address this. And I'm seeing a lot, for example, more discussion, not my field of expertise, but let me just put this out there, around, say, the subject of machine learning and the dangers of machine learning than we heard, say, even five years ago or 10 years ago around new social media platforms. Now, that just might be that the threats of machine learning are more obvious, but I actually think it might be that the thought leaders are starting to have much more of a sense of responsibility. Um, the culture of Silicon Valley has been, as I think was articulated in a New York Times article quite recently, um, build it and ask for forgiveness later. Yeah. I, I think we're starting to, to move away from that. And so I see the, again, optimist that I am, the beginnings of that development of social responsibility. We see that among our students here as well. Right. So I want to ask you about the students right. in the next segment, but I, I, I want to back off to the, I want to ask about the thought leaders and, mm -hmm. and, the, and the innovators. I mean, I, 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 I grew up to believe let science and innovation go, right? The, you said innovate it, build it, then, then worry about the consequences. Because if you start out, I mean, do you believe we should ever restrain uh, technology and science in advance saying, don't go there, don't go there, don't I, go there? I, I don't think that works. I think certainly at the basic discovery, scientific discovery stage, you don't know enough. Mm. And then even when you're going into the technology stage, I mean, you may discover a biological weapon, you may discover limited nuclear weapons and decide we're not gonna build limited nuclear weapons. But you know, I have to know what could be done there because somebody else, that bad guy on the other side of the field might not have had the same moral sense of responsibility. So, so I have to be able to defend myself. But since science is about the dissemination, it's, if we're talking science, yeah. right, and universities, for example, and we're not talking private industry, we don't keep our discoveries secret. We disseminate them, we publish them, right? The world, I mean, I think every, I, I, I suspect, tell me if I'm right about this, probably every college physics student knows how to build a nuclear bomb. Uh, it, uh, no, not. no, it's, it's actually not that easy, but. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying they have the capacity, <laughs> but, but they know what has to be, or they can figure out what well, has they to be know, They all know the basic right. physics. Right. Um, the technology to make it, to really have. Right, and um, to make it miniature uh, and all that stuff. Right. And, and, and to assure criticality and, criticality and so forth is, uh, is not, it's hard, but I am told if you search hard enough on the internet, you can, you can find it to make smaller nuclear weapons. So you control the fissile and material. Take the, the Iranians who Trump is so worried about and the world is worried about, I mean, they're smart enough. Oh, sure. They're technologically advanced enough that if they set their mind to it, now the question is, will we put a stop to it? But they're technologically advanced enough to do this. Right. 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 You can't take this knowledge and put it in some bottle, so. Right, so that was why so many people worked for so hard on the non-proliferation treaty, and we didn't get it. And, um, and that's where the focus now is, is in proliferation. It's not so much in uh, mutual assured destruction and worry, worry about the Soviet Union, which doesn't exist anymore. So, so it sounds like they're actually in a way, three stages here. There's the stage of invention, and, and I think you're making very, I agree with you, I think we can't stop that. Right. But then there's the stage of, of uh, uh, you know, recognizing that it's potentially dangerous, yes. and maybe we should be encouraging people to do that. And then potentially down the line, there are interventions that we can use, uh, regulations or social norms. Right, and, and I think it is, the, I think that's a wonderful separation, Josh, and, and it's at that middle stage where it's absolutely critical for the technologists the, themselves to uh, have a sense of moral and social responsibility right. towards what they see themselves uh, developing. Really? That is the critical moment. Right. Because You're if it's later and it's regulation, it's not so good. Right. You're listening to Philosophy Talk. We're talking about monstrous technologies in front of a live audience at the Stanford campus with our guest, Bruce Drell. And we've got questions from that live audience. I'll go from one side to the other of the room. I'll start with you. Uh, Welcome, uh, step forward, tell us your name, where you're from. Don't tell us last name, just first name, because there are crazy people out there. Welcome to <laughs> Philosophy Talk. <laughs> Welcome to Philosophy Talk, sir. Hi. Good evening, my name is Jayesh. I did my master's here at Stanford. Um, 
Thank you for having me here. Um, very quickly, my question is, uh, you made a very good point about not being able to stifle or stop or slow down the invention phase of technology. But what about the aspect of influencing it? Because there's a lot of discussion around how, for example, all these things like Twitter, Facebook, Google were built by a select few of the world and how that's affected those, the way those technologies have shaped our world. For example, Twitter is a great place where people are harassed and bullied all, over, all the time. And people have discussed about how uh, they have, it has implications on people's lives, both positive and negative. Um, what are your thoughts on how we can sort of change that? How can we add more diversity in both in terms of the people who are inventing those technologies as well as the ideas that we use when we do that? Got an answer? No, you, you, you're, you're looking at me. I was <laughs> yeah, like, I'm looking at you. I'm gonna... So, um, so Twitter is, again, it's a tool that has marvelous benefits and it is used in really negative ways. Um, I, I ponder a lot, is there a way of ensuring at least some accountability in Twitter? And um, my understanding is that many companies uh, in these, uh, they actually have rules that they don't even enforce themselves about fake accounts and so forth. So that is a place where the, I believe Twitter, let's pick on them, should actually force a little more accountability in the use of its platform. And along with that, it would be great for society to realize that um, just because speech is protected doesn't mean it's actually appropriate all the time. Right. So what do you think about the following? Thing? I think in America, we have and I think this is really connected to technology too, although it may not sound like it at first. We have the wrong model of a corporation. We have a shareholder model of a corporation. The corporation is supposed to serve its shareholders. I think we need to uh, advance to a stakeholder model. Of a, the, a corporation should serve its stakeholders. And who is the stakeholders? Lots and lots of people. So that the interest of lots and lots of people are somehow brought to bear. I know there's a debate about this in economic theory and all this sort of stuff, but it seems to me until we make the corporations accountable in a broader way, we're, either we're going to have the heavy hand of government or, or something. I mean, what do you think of that? I'm a physicist. You're a philosopher. <laughs> we're redesigning the US economy as we speak. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> 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 oh, I got another question. Welcome to Philosophy Talks there. So I'm Carl for a long time. I was at MIT, but now I'm here at Stanford. And uh, it has its advantages here, you know. But anyway, uh, we're building the internet of traitorous things, where device is traitorous if it works against the interests of its users. The biggest companies in the valley think that within 10 years, the majority of the people in this room will be wearing hollow glasses. What are we going to do where everything that you do, see, and say can be recorded and owned by somebody else? Stay home and never go out in the public. You don't have to wear the darn glasses. You don't have to give all your information away. Luddites aren't going to make it. Do you have a cell phone? Yes. Oh, you're in. Okay. <laughs> so, so Chris, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna, you said you responded to the last set of questions. You said, we're philosophers, you're a physicist, here we are redesigning the economy. But this is, this is part of my point, and I wonder what you think yeah. about this. We all have to be into this making and remaking of the world together, and, wow. and you can't, we, I don't want to train our students to say, hey, look, I'm an engineer, I'm a physicist. I right? totally agree with you, Ken. Right? So how do, we, how do we do that? How do we get this conversation to be a broad conversation involving all these people? Because it seems to me that's what we need. We need the physicist sitting with the philosopher, sitting with the politician, sitting with the journalist, right? And the economists, let's not forget the economists, because they actually know what they're doing in this right. case. Um, <laughs> nah, maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but there are some models. I mean, you know, uh, hospitals have ethics boards um, and, and, and are, responsibil are responsible for aren't, certain kinds of... What? Aren't we responsible for there being... Uh, yeah, re, uh, review boards, right? H human stuff because of the some experiments that took place oh, here at Stanford. The prison experiment. Yes. Oh, yeah, wow. yes, the IRB. Yes. Right. So, so it's not as I mean, it's not as though everything's the Wild West. 
right? So, and, and so we just have to throw up our hands. It seems to me that in fact we, you know, we could shift, we could decide as a society we want to shift some of these areas of technological in innovation more in the direction of things that have a little bit of inbuilt policing and responsibility. Yes, we could, and, uh, and it wouldn't be that hard to do. The first thing, though, is to acknowledge the threat. And I think that's really what's just happening. Okay. So I, I, I agree with where you're going, but I would point that it probably is a little unrealistic to think it would all be in place now, because I just don't think until, until a few years ago we recognized the magnitude of the threat. Right. Welcome to Philosophy Talk, ma'am. What's your comment or question? Who are you and what's your comment or question? Uh, my name is Victoria, and I'm currently an undergraduate student on campus. So uh, I guess my question is philosophical, perhaps, in nature. Um, since stru structurally, the rise of artificial intelligence, or by extension, the aspiring to develop it and research it, implies the displacement of conventional workforces, right? So the abilities of computers to start taking on uh, complicated tasks that is beyond even monotony. Uh, so we've seen, you know, in cases where they're starting to take on diagnosing diseases or produce legal documents or, you know, even creative, creating a poem, etc. So in that case, of course, these abilities got magnified and, you know, those workers that are the most vulnerable in societies are harmed the most. So in that case, do you think there's a moral responsibility of companies or people who participate in AI development to compensate that in forms of taxation or others? And how do we go about <laughs> kind of thinking about that conceptually? Do you have a view or you want to punt this one? Well, I, I do, but I actually would love to hear from the philosopher first. Uh. Well, <laughs> well, I think this is a really hard question. And I, and I think it's a, a huge question because there are people, speaking of the economists, I mean, there's a disagreement about this. People used to believe that in the old days, technology destroyed jobs, but it produced compensating jobs. That's actually not as true as you might think. That's a complicated thing. But there's a, some people believe the day is coming when technology is just a net destroyer, destroyer of the demand for human labor, and that, and that we could see that in the next 10 or 15 years, we could see the demand for human labor decrease 50, 40%. In the next, by the next century, we could see the demand for human labor almost go away, right? How do, how do we live in such a world? Of course there's a moral responsibility, but who does it fall on? It's a really hard, I mean, that is among the hardest questions Look, we face. I'm not saying it's an easy question, but I, I think we can apply similar principles here to the ones we apply elsewhere and just say, look, if there is something that a reasonable person or set of people could predict, then you should be setting about trying to predict it. And if you're not even trying, then I think you can be held liable for that. So we, we got, we, there's a lot, a lot of questions. We got to take a break. We'll start the next segment with a bunch of questions after some more music. But I remind you, we're listening to, you're listening to Philosophy Talk. We're coming to you from Simex Auditorium as part of, on the Stanford campus as part of this university's Frankenstein at 200 project. We're thinking about monstrous technologies with Persis Drell, Stanford's new provost. In our final segment, we'll ask Persis how she thinks we should train the engineers of the future. Educating for responsibility, plus more questions from our audience, when Philosophy Talk continues.
Thanks once again to our live musical guests, the Tiffany Austin Trio. I'm Josh Landy, and this is Philosophy Talk, the program that questions everything. Except your intelligence. I'm Ken Taylor. We're thinking about monstrous technologies with Persis Drell from Stanford University. So we've got a whole bunch of questions. So let me start uh, with some, uh, I don't know, I think I was on this side of the room. Welcome to Philosophy Talk now. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm an undergraduate here at Stanford. Um, and we live in a world in which there are huge socioeconomic disparities. And as newer technologies become available, they're often only available to those of higher socioeconomic status. So I was wondering what y'all's opinions were on how inventors and companies can ensure that those disparities don't become so big that they're unable to be overcome. Presupposition of her question is that it is the responsibility of the technologists themselves. Do you think, do you share that presupposition? Or is that a broader society responsibility? Uh, I, would l I would like to say I think broader society should take responsibility. I like it when technology does take responsibility too. But I, I, I would also like to point out in some ways, certain technology has been incredibly de democratizing. Um, so it, it has cut both ways. But ultimately for me, and this probably reveals a certain amount about my political persuasions, I do believe society should be taking responsibility um, to ensure that it is available broadly. So how do we do that? Well, you're not a, you're not a political <laughs> person, I won't ask. We could but, go there, but. Yeah, but, but, but <laughs> we make but, you philosopher king. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I do want to ask you a question about something you said, though. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you said technologies that are democratizing. Sometimes technologies that look democratizing, so the internet is supposed to be a great democratizing technology, right? Sometimes technology that are democratizing just break down the, the public square because they, they substitute noise for knowledge, right? In, instead of these authorized, these top, one of the things that these top-down authorities did, they certified stuff as legitimate, as knowable, as worth paying attention to. When everybody has access, but let me give a very specific example. Theoretical yeah. physics used to be if you want to do theoretical physics, you had to be in one of those pillars like Princeton or Stanford or Harvard or uh, Oxford. And, and if you wanted to learn about the hottest, latest thing in theoretical physics, you had to write away with a little postcard for yeah. a preprint. Okay, yeah, that's those. gone. Yeah, yeah, that's and true. now theoretical physics innovation comes from all across the world. That's it's true. been phenomenal. That's true. That's the upside. Right. I'm the optimist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Philosophy Talk, sir. What's your comment or question? I'm Wade from Portland, Oregon. And as an aspiring engineer in a very large organization, uh, how, do you, how do you feel one should navigate uh, these considerations when you're just a tidy cog and maybe a much greater machine? Yeah, there you go, Persis. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's for Never you. Never lose your moral compass, no matter what level you are in the organization and uh, hold yourself accountable to it, and it will guide you. Well, okay, so that, those are inspiring words. So, so this brings me to asking you, what, what do we do, is, uh, is this what, you know, is, is this, are these words enough to inspire the next generation of, of budding engineers? We've, we've got a room, including some current right. students here. So what, what, do we, what do we do to try to make sure that the next generation are, are gonna be helping the world rather than sort of new Victor Frankenstein's creating without the proper vigilance. So I am a huge believer that engineers need to be educated not just in engineering, but they need to be educated broadly because they need to care about the impacts of the technologies that they're gonna be involved in inventing. They don't get that by taking more physics classes or more <laughs> math classes or more engineering classes. They get that by taking a philosophy course or they get that by taking a literature course and being forced to think through the impacts of what they're doing, or if they're really more directly interested, take a social science course. But I think that educating engineers to be engineers only is criminal. I, I totally agree with you. I say to students, I put it starkly, and they sometimes gasp. <laughs> I say, uh, you know, Hitler had his technologist. Stalin had his technologist. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to be a technologist. If you're just a technologist, you're fit to be a tool of some broader social thing. But is that what you want? Yeah. You want to just be a tool, yeah. right? And uh, students sometimes are taken aback when I, 
I, I, <laughs> I say this, but that brings to how do we make them not just be tools? How do we educate them to be technology leaders and thinkers? I mean, what you you say they should you. Well, it's a, I, I know, I think you think, you would like them to take a, say a philosophy course, but you're not gonna force them to take a philosophy course. You're not gonna require them to do that. Well, I do believe that um, if you require things, people do them uh, because it's required, but they have, if they don't come to subjects willingly, they're not gonna absorb and learn them and, and internalize them. And then it's just a waste of time. So um, they have to come willingly uh, at Stanford and most other institutions we have gentle ways of encouraging people to get breadth. Um, they could be a little less gentle in some ways. They could be a little more prescriptive. But, but, here's, but the, here's, I, where, I, well, here's where I think the university education is, is and I think it is in a great crisis. I believe mm -hmm. we're in a crisis state. And one, there, I think there are two sources of the crisis, but we're focused on one source. I think we have become too focused on imparting into our students a narrow technocratic education, right? And partly our students are demand, want that of us because of their mm -hmm. parents and they, right. the, you know, we have this silly representation, which is uh, reputation that's undeserved as get rich you and all that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. And they think chase the brass ring mm -hmm. and get the, the hot job and all that stuff. And, and I think we need to address this. And I don't think this is a small thing. I think it's a huge thing. Okay, so, but there's another piece of it, which is that, so I do think we have students majoring in technical subjects, computer science, whatever, uh, for the wrong reasons, and, I'll, and, and helping them choose the subject they want to major in for the right reasons is, is obviously part of our responsibility, and we could be doing it better. But I also think that, um, and here I'm going to speak as somebody who was, a, 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 I was only in the School of Engineering for two and a half years. I'm not an engineer. I've never taken an engineering course. But what engineering did, which was really very, and is doing, which is very impressive, is they actually think a lot about not just what do they need to impart to the students, but what do the students want to learn and how do they want to learn it? Right. And that focus has helped some of the majors, and CS is one of them, be incredibly attractive and with really good on-ramps. I, I understand that. I and don't, and I, don't, I think other subjects, certainly my own subject, I, could learn a few lessons from yeah. that. Welcome to Philosophy Talk, sir. What's your comment or question? Okay. Um, I want to defend some economists now. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I teach economics. My name is Malkiat. I teach economics, business, and computer information systems. And one of the things I want to presuppose is that uh, economic growth is good, first of all. Can we agree, right. agree upon that? Okay. I so if economic growth is good, one of the leading sources, this is just principles level, uh, economics. I'm quoting here uh, Robert Hall and uh, mm -hmm. John Taylor because that's the textbook that we use for principles of economics. And most of the growth that's taken place in the last 50 years in the modern world, in the first world, has been due to technological increases. So increases in productivity, not increases due to more people working or working harder. And that also, that economic growth also brings about good things. We have life for longer life expectancy. Mm -hmm. And what you can't just say people live longer, but what happens when people live longer, the useful life is a lot longer. You have people, mm -hmm. I think, Probably 50 is the new 30 now. I, I like uh, to things think like so. that. So, and well, well, <laughs> yeah, let sure. me ask you a question though, because as an economist, what side are you on? On so you can, productivity. Well, uh, yeah. One person doing producing more, you know, more production per capita or something exactly. like that, right? But what what do you think about this debate of whether technology is going to demand dim, diminish the net dim, de, decrease the net demand for human labor? Oh, is that going to happen That's or not? exactly what my next point. What, what, one of the things I tell my macroeconomics students is, when we're talking about economic growth, because that's a large focus of a macroeconomics class, is where are people migrating to in the, in the world? Are they migrating to the robots or away from the robots? Where are they migrating to? Where their factories are? Where their computers are or away from them? So we see that you know, we have, in, at, at this point in human history, we probably have more people working as a percentage of the population and, and especially adult age people with opportunities. And we also have, you know, and, and you have to say that there are more people being employed. One of the things you have to take a look at is, is people will be displaced. So t to a certain degree, technology displaces people. Uh, but those are the people who don't a lot of times have the education to adjust. So you have to be malleable. So, and to a certain degree, uh, machines or robots, I'll just refer, are substitutes for humans, but to a greater degree, they're complements. So machines and people work together, and that's why you see increasing growth. Yeah. 
Okay, so. This is just. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we're gonna. Let, okay. I'm gonna let. So for, the, uh, that's 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 my that's my question. There is why is that bad then? Why is it bad if we're having technology, and it's increasing growth and good things are happening? Why is that bad? Well, I, I'm no economist. I'm no futurist. Uh, the the fear is uh, take uh, driverless driverless technology. There are three million people, I think, in this country, who make their living off driving more, things, more right? More. Uh, and they're going to be displaced pretty quickly. And that's a good, stable, middle-class job. And those people are not malleable. I mean, a, it, I mean, you could say, well, be malleable, but people aren't as malleable. I mean, a 50-year-old truck driver in Pennsylvania who gets displaced, he's just displaced. He's not going to do anything else. And how do we deal with that? And that's not to mention climate change, right? I mean, we're, we're making all of these incremental advances in, in life expectancy and things like that, but this is coming at the cost of future generations, and we're not thinking about that. Then, mm -hmm. ultimately, all of, these, all of these advances are just going to be completely dwarfed by, by the challenges we're going to face in the future. So, you want to respond to that? No, I just want to leave a, end on an optimistic note. That <laughs> <laughs> it's all going to be that, okay. No, I, I, it's not going to be okay if we don't work at it. Right. But we have to work at it. Right. And we cannot give up and cede that responsibility to anyone else. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. Uh, this is basically the end of the show, except there are people standing in line with questions. And if you're standing in line with questions, we're going to take your questions. I'm going to make a clean break. You probably won't get on the air, but you'll get to talk to us anyway. So we'll take these people who are standing in line, come up to the mics, and, and then I'm going to stop, and I'm gonna, you're going to say something wise, and then the, we'll, we'll say goodbye to you, OK? okay. <laughs> <laughs> but right now, we're going to take these three people. Even <laughs> wiser than that? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so. OK. He needs a clean break for editing. Welcome to Philosophy Talk, sir. What's your comment or question? The one area I know about is self-driving cars, and so there's a big push for that. And the technologies that are required is so complex, so a lot of people, scientists and engineers, are working on this. But all the scientists and engineers who are working on this, they don't really ask you know, the future implications of self-driving cars. But a lot of burden is not on them. It's on the capitalistic system. It's the heads of Google and Ford who are actually want to make a lot of money out of the self-driving car business. So, um, so who should like? How do you think we should push back on the self-driving cars, for example, as consumers? Hmm. Well, um, if we don't like self-driving cars, no one's going to force us to get them. The fact is that if we have self-driving cars, it will be extremely attractive. It will make commutes more attractive. It will make, uh, probably make highways safer. Right. No doubt it will make um, highways safer. So I think you could argue that the technology is good. Uh, you worry about the loss of jobs, and that is then a societal responsibility for either retraining or slow uh, evolution. I think actually uh, one thing that we can do, I don't know that we will do it, is that um, I think the transition between every vehicle having a person in it driving, actively driving, and a, a, a fleet of vehicles with no one in it is actually a slow transition. And so you could do it in an evolutionary way if you really thought about it and, and uh, planned it. That's definitely right. Uh I mean, I think the deeper point is that we've got to get past thinking of, a, of technology. And I think this, in educating our students, we have to do this too. We think we have to, thinking of the technology and technological innovation as just a thing unto mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. yep. That just, well, we produce it, it changes the world. We, you know, oh my God, right. we didn't have any agency in changing the world that way. How does technology change the world? By being deployed by human beings in a context. All right, it's part of a much bigger a, system. Right. Right. Say again? It's part of a much bigger system. Right. Yes, and so we have to think about the whole system-wide thing, and right. even a young designer... Can do that. Can, ...can be alive to the fact that I'm entering a large, complicated system, right. and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm a thought leader, and I went to a place like Stanford, and I should be reflective, and I should be a citizen, and all that stuff. I mean, it gets right. back to Persis' earlier okay. point, right? So, you know, don't just study your, t your particular field, yeah. but... Learn about human psychology. Learn about macroeconomics. Learn about right. uh, dance. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> first, first thing. Learn yeah. how to write. Welcome to Philosophy Talk. What's your comment or question? So I'll just go back, and then we'll 
have a clean break. Okay, good evening. Uh, my name's Shelby, and I have engineering and business degrees from here at Stanford. And uh, th there's two points. I, uh, I, I want to be an optimist. I am an optimist somehow or other, but logic gets in the way. <laughs> <laughs> and when you talk about people using technology, people being responsible, the problem that I see there is it has to be every person responsible forever. I mean, you know, we've got things going on in North Korea. We got this, that, uh, you know, they're doing CRISPR all over the world and creating stuff. I mean, it's just out there and, you know, that's the one thing. And then the other thing is that we have AI. Now, AI is a different monster from all the others because it can have a will of its own philosophically potentially uh, and we don't know what kind of will it might develop so those are now so what's the question how can we not be pessimistic even though yeah, I yeah that's one for you for us to say <laughs> but i gotta say ai ai is coming like gangbusters yeah ai is coming like gangbusters and the promise, you know, John McCarthy, our former mm -hmm. colleague, our late colleague, they had this meeting back in, I don't know, when was it, 1950 or something like that? They got together, they thought, oh, by 1970, the AI, okay, that was a little premature, yeah. right? But AI is coming like gangbusters. And the day is coming when anything a human can do, some AI software will be able to do better. That's just coming. I, I'll take I, that bet. Yeah, I will too. No, it's coming. <laughs> I, I want to see anything a human I want to see do. someone design the look, software to detect look, irony. Look, it's already yeah, yeah. the case. And this isn't even a super intelligent AI. It's just just think machine learning technique. They can already outdiagnose your average doctor. Right? They, okay, they diagnosis. Can, they, fine. Anything that involves pattern recognition uh, that involves We do a lot of things that are beyond pattern recognition. I know that. <laughs> I'm talking about today and what's coming next. It's it's coming. Okay, we'll take if a If you want to be disappointed, just, just, <laughs> no. just try Google Translate, then yeah. you'll, you'll, you'll sleep better. <laughs> but you know how, you know, you know, you know how, get, you know how Google, well, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> Welcome to Velocity Talk. Show. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'd like to just compliment the last speaker because uh, he usurped most of what I wanted to say. <laughs> you talk about technology, but there isn't a technology. And I'd like to at least just have you distinguish, as he was trying to say, like the world of medicine has done magnificent things. I mean, you know, you cannot deny that. Yeah. Yet, on the other hand, in areas where they have begun to encroach on truly dangerous things, the world of medicine seems to have taken it seriously, and they yeah. are doing right. something right. about it. Yeah. Right. And I'm presuming it's because the government has been bothering. It's really a serious issue. Somehow the world of technology is focused on, you know, kiddie things and so forth that are fun and so forth. And, you know, there is this issue of the fact that I think uh, somebody like Fowler uh, writes a book, and he's a little ex obviously extremist, and I haven't finished the book to be truthful, but the reality is that the, you know, he's saying good things about the fact that the owners of these magnificent six companies or whatever they are, you know, really think they own, you know, they're very godlike, you know, and they are determined to guide our will. I mean, they are the gatekeepers. You know, they, we learn what we want to learn from them. They can model it. They can yeah. mo modify it. It's a dangerous issue. And if you think that they're going to ultimately come forth and say, well, we're going to drop all this and, you know, forget it. Yeah. I mean, to, to, to be pessimistic is one thing, but to do something about it is going to require... I think ultimately that there's a stand up sort of thing, sort of like Florida youngsters getting up and saying enough already. There's going to have to be some group stand up and get some action out of a, a Congress or someplace that says, look, you can't let this go on. You've created a, a division of labor, I mean, a division of money that's unacceptable. You've created the ability to take everybody's privacy and destroy it. I mean, you have, that's what they were saying. You have no privacy. You own a phone, you have no privacy. I mean, it's just. Okay. So, Persis, this is, goes back to your where are the grown-ups, no right? Question. Yeah, it right. goes back to where are the grown-ups. Right. And uh, what, what I think is um, 
is, it, it, it will be fascinating when the history of this is written because I'm not sure even the owners of those companies had a clue what was going to be coming. They have a choice to start taking some responsibility or government regulation will come in and break them up the way AT and T was broken up. I mean, there is a uh, there is an ultimate authority there. We think, um, and I, but I'm not sure that's the right answer. So I, I actually do hope the grown-ups stand up and start working at it. Okay, the last question. Thanks. Um, I wanted to ask about the discussion you had about encouraging humanities education. Mm -hmm. um, I my husband and I are both alumni here. He was in the a philosophy major and I was an engineering major and we discussed this a lot about our own children now where he hopes they get a strong humanities mm -hmm. education. And you? And I say absolutely, like it's good to get some but uh. way better major in engineering. And it comes back to, I find it's employable to get the engineering degree. And I do believe you're a better person for having a humanities education, but then what happens after they get out of college? They need to pay for their rent. They need to right. you know, do all these things. So I mean, how do we close the gap there? So we encourage more, I, mean, I, 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 took, I, I take it that Persis wasn't necessarily recommending that people uh, major in a, a, a humanities subject. No. Right? But right. So, so the, thought, actually, the thought could just be, look, if you're going to be an engineer, you know, also learn some other things. So well, I think there's a good compromise. Yeah, well, but I think if I were to lay my bet on the table of the degree of the future, it is not the pure engineering degree. It's mm -hmm. going to be a social science degree with computational literacy, literacy, because you need to know the questions to ask. And there are these huge societal challenges, and I do believe the social sciences helps you understand what questions to ask, but you can't understand them without computational literacy. So I really think that's the magic combination that I would, would put my, my money on. So if you um, really want your kids to get a job. The, so uh, look, uh, the degree of the future. <laughs> this isn't going on the radio, so I can say this. <laughs> this is a Stanford audience. The degree of the future is the symbolic systems degree at Stanford. Uh, <laughs> and with that, <laughs> it's dance. Uh, dance I, I, I wanna, is the degree wanna, of the future. <laughs> <laughs> I want to address this. I want to address this briefly, and then we'll, I'll give you a clean break, Devin. Uh, uh, I, I think. Look, we are educating the makers of the world, the remakers of the world. Human, so human society is constantly making and remaking itself. And, 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 and these Stanford students that we educate, they're going to play a role in making and remaking the world. And we need to educate them in multiple things. Yes. Right. We need to turn out excellent students. In all, we need to turn out the great engineers, great scientists, great, great artists, great literary uh, thinkers, great philosophers, great social scientists. But we also need them each to understand that making and remaking the world is a deeply collaborative thing that requires multiple disciplinary talent. There is no competition. We have this stupid thing at Stanford. The students say, well, you were techie or fuzzy. You better be both. Right. You better be a too fuzzy or a, te or a techie or whatever that yeah. is. Because if we don't produce people who, in whom all these things live simultaneously, the making and remaking of the world will be a disaster. Well, in the very. Yeah. Uh, moral compass. Of course it does. <laughs> Are you training for that or not? Yes, uh, we. It's on the list I heard you just recite. Oh, yeah, I, I, I'm deeply committed to that. I, I, I'm deeply, deeply committed to that. Yeah. Okay. So now we're going to pretend none of that happened, Devin. <laughs> so I'm going to give Devin. I'm, what I'm going to say is, uh, Persis, you got one last bit of wisdom for us, right? So, okay. Uh oh. So he needs a clean break. Pressure's on. So, Persis, you got one last bit of wisdom for us? I think we have to hold on to our optimism despite the challenges ahead. Well, on that optimistic note, I'm going to thank you for joining <laughs> us. It's been a it's been a great conversation. Thank you. Our guest has been Persis Strell, former dean of the Stanford School of Engineering and recently appointed as our university's 13th provost. Now, this conversation continues at Philosopher's Corner at our online community of thinkers where our motto is cogito ergo blogo, I think, Therefore, I blog. And you can become a partner in that community just by visiting our website, philosophytalk.org. And if you have a question that wasn't addressed in today's show, either here or on the radio, we'd love to hear from you. 
email our, your question to us at comments at philosophytalk.org, and we may feature it on our blog. Now let's hear from a man of monstrously rapid speech. It's Ian Scholes, the 60-second philosopher. Ian Scholes. At the time Mary Shelley created Frankenstein on a bar bet, kind of, Galvani had just made a dead frog's leg twitch with electricity, allegedly, and grave robbers were digging up bodies for medical students to use in their anatomy classes, all of which kind of provided the juice, as it were, for her novel. One of the reasons body snatching was so reviled was the widespread Christian belief that come Judgment Day we would be resurrected whole. Cutting up bodies might make such a resurrection a little more problematic. I don't know what the view was on amputees or guillotine victims, though headless ghosts, again, you might recall, were a bit of a literary trope for a long while there. Also, about 10 years after the writing of Frankenstein, two enterprising grave robbers named Burke and Hare took anatomy research a step further by murdering people to provide cadavers for anatomy lectures. 16 in all, it is believed, their unique method of strangulation became known as burking, just as Galvani's name wound up describing frog leg twitching. And the name of Frankenstein came to be known as the monster, not the creator of the monster. What's up with that? The whims of legend often trump the facts of history, as we all know. The recent passing of the Reverend Billy Graham is certainly proof of that. I recall his being regarded as a somewhat relatively liberal figure in the evangelical world, certainly ecumenical, dining with popes and talk show hosts and presidents, a preacher who eschewed fire and brimstone, had a nice haircut, wore tailored suits, and did not sweat or storm about. But when he died, my, 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 there was a torrent of ill-wishers. Glad he was dead because of anti-Semitism, and he had lunch with Kissinger. Same guy, but now he's a monster. We have seen the reputations of Darwin, Freud, and Marx go up and down, with Darwin and Marx sometimes achieving monstrousness, along with misapprehension, and Freud achieving more and more irrelevance as drugs replace therapy, and psychotherapists wander the streets carrying their sad little signs, we'll reveal your unconscious processes for food. <laughs> The monsters of tomorrow are being stitched together today with gene splicing, artificial intelligence applications, autonomous cars, global warming fears, and the tyranny of the algorithm. <clears throat> These could be real monsters or just topics for the blockbusters of tomorrow, like cloning dinosaurs, for instance. It has proven to be not so much a threat to humanity as a never-ending money machine without once achieving reality. As for the Frankenstein monster himself, vivisection does not hold the appeal it once did, though artificial limbs abound, along with hearing aids, eyeglasses, mood-enhancing drugs, endurance-enhancing drugs, strength-enhancing drugs that can serve to make any of us an ugly, psychotic monster with preternatural abilities. No Frankenstein creator needed. Right off the shelf, eliminate the middleman. Also, with advanced post-Freudian counseling techniques, we can embrace our new selves, the stray limbs we acquired legally, assimilate it into a new post-human whole. And should we choose to run amok, under medical supervision, of course, and then escape to the Arctic, global warming will assure that we are not fleeing from pursuers, leaping from ice flow to ice flow, but relaxing on the newly warm and placid sea, on a flotation device, catching up with the latest fake news on our smartphone, and rubbing sunscreen on our brand new legs. <laughs> a little R&R, &R and then back to DC to lobby for the transhuman movement. Hacked lives matter. Won't you please give? I gotta go. <laughs> Talk is a presentation of KALW, Local Public Radio San Francisco, and the trustees of Leland Jr. Stanford University, copyright 2018. Our executive producers are David Demarest and Matt Martin. Special thanks to the Stanford School of Engineering, the Symbolic Systems Program, the Department of Philosophy, and the Medicine and the Muse Program. Thanks also to Sun Lee, Emily King, Dan Brandon, Carola Kreitmeyer, Conchita Perales and our musical guest, Adam Shulman on piano, David Yule on the bass, and the one and only Tiffany Austin on vocals. The senior producer of Philosophy Talk is Devin Strolovich. 
Laura McGuire is our director of research, and our marketing director is Cindy Prince-Bound. Support for Philosophy Talk comes from various groups here at Stafford University and the partners in our online community of thinkers. The views expressed or misexpressed on this program do not necessarily represent the opinions of Stanford University or our other funders. Not even when they're true and reasonable. <laughs> The conversation continues on our website, philosophytalk.org, where you too can become a partner in our community of thinkers. I'm Josh Landy. And I'm Ken Taylor. Thank you for listening. And thank you for thinking. And that's a wrap. Stand up. Become one who could have